Sup Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, sometimes people have criticized me on this channel for focusing too heavily on Finasteride. I have even heard people suggest I should rename my channel to Finasteride Cafe since the bulk of my content consists of videos about Finasteride. Make no mistake, one of the objectives of this channel is to encourage people to use Finasteride since I feel the majority of people who avoid the drug do so due to the rampant misinformation and fear-mongering about the drug online. I feel a duty to my fellow hair loss witchers to dispel some of that misinformation so they don't go bald as a consequence of avoiding finasteride when chances are they would have responded well to the drug. That is a travesty I simply cannot abide here at the Hair Cafe Institute of Research and Science. Still, I digress. Because this channel is not a finasteride channel, this is a channel about fighting hair loss. It just so happens that my channel's objectives fall in line with the promotion of conventional therapies like finasteride and minoxidil since those are the two available treatments that are backed by the most evidence-based data. However, we're not just fixated on the present here. No, we're looking towards the future of hair loss treatments, Chooms, and I made it a purpose on this channel to look at new treatments on the horizon, and there are a lot of exciting future remedies we're talking about here. We're talking about GT20029, pyrolutamide, Cosma RNA, the wind pathway drugs, etc. And I made videos on all these treatments and the research behind them. So I initially thought I was all caught up in my exploration of these hypothetical future treatments. It turns out, though, I missed one. And this potential future treatment, even though it may not be the most promising one on the horizon, its mechanism makes it so that it may very well be the most interesting one, at least. What I am talking about is a protein called Pi-1, as well as some drugs for hair loss being developed called ET02 and ET03, and my coverage of these drugs has been heavily requested. And conveniently for me, it turns out these ET drugs and Pi-1 are all related to each other, so I wonder, what's the big deal here? Are we looking at another GT20029, or is this going to be yet another disappointing theory that explains everything? Well, let's find out. First, Let's start with PI-1. PI-1 stands for Plasminogen Activator Inhibitor 1. There's actually also a PI-2, but it is only present in the placenta in pregnant women. We can forget about that one. But PI-1 turns out to be a very important protein in the human body. PI-1 has to do with the blood clotting system in the body. And no, before you ask, this is not the blood flu theory we're talking about here. Bear with me, chums, because the blood clotting system is very complicated, as you can see in this figure right here. But we're not going to worry about all the the details of how blood clots work and how they form and all that stuff. Instead, we're going to focus on how blood unclots, meaning how blood clots dissolve in the body. Yes, Mother Nature has provided us with both a blood clotting system and a blood unclotting system, and the unclotting system is called the fibrinolytic system. So, if we didn't have this unclotting system, all the blood in our bodies would just clot up and we wouldn't last very long. So, this unclotting system is very important to balance out the clotting system. The way the unclotting system works is that a protein called plasminogen is converted by other proteins called TPA and UPA to form what's called plasmin. And plasmin is the protein in the body responsible for breaking up blood clots. So these are what people call clot-busting drugs. And here's where we finally get the PI-1. Like I said before, PI-1 stands for Plasminogen Activator Inhibitor 1. So what it does is that it prevents TPA and UPA from activating plasminogen and thus prevents the formation of plasmin. So, it may take some mental gymnastics to understand because it's kind of like a double negative, but if you think about it, if Pi-1 stops the formation of plasmin, that means it stops the body from dissolving clots. So, if your Pi-1 levels are increased, your body is more likely to form clots, which could actually be a bad thing since blood clots can cause things like strokes and heart attacks. Not only that, Pi-1 has some other effects besides the effects on blood clotting. Pi-1 can also cause cell aging. So, drugs that block Pi-1 are being looked at as possible anti-aging drugs. So that's all fine and dandy, of course, but the name of this channel is Hair Cafe, not Anti-Aging Cafe. So what does any of this have to do with hair growth or preventing hair loss? Well, some investigators have proposed that androgenic alopecia is kind of like an acceleration of the aging process, since men tend to lose hair as they get older, though there are plenty of men that keep a full head of hair into their 70s and beyond, like David Bowie and Harrison Ford, for instance. So in a sense, people who have androgenic alopecia just have some kind of premature aging of their hair, 
and this premature aging could be related to levels of Pi-1. Now, that's an oversimplification, of course, since we know that people with androgenic alopecia have excessive amounts of the type 2 5-AR enzyme, and therefore, they have an increase in the trash hormone DHT in the areas of the scalp where they lose their hair. Clearly, DHT is the main culprit in androgenic alopecia, but the way DHT actually causes hair loss is due to what are called downstream effects. What this means is that DHT activates the androgen receptors in the hair follicles, and this sets in motion a lot of molecular changes that eventually lead to losing hair. We know that DHT ends up inhibiting the WNT wind pathway, which is important for hair growth, and also it has effects on growth factors like VEGF, IgA1, TGF-beta, prostaglandins, and even may affect the synthesis of prolactin, and all these factors have been shown to have a negative effect on hair growth. So it's possible that DHT could cause changes in Pi-1 levels as yet another downstream effect of DHT that leads to hair loss. Of course, right now, we have two drugs that can eliminate all these downstream effects by diminishing the common cause of all these downstream effects, and these drugs are finasteride and dutasteride, which block the 5-AR enzyme that creates the trash hormone DHT. Nevertheless, there are other drugs in development for hair loss that attack these downstream effects specifically, like the WNT wind pathway drugs, so let's not dismiss the strategy out of hand completely. It's also possible that people with androgenic alopecia have higher levels of Pi-1 than people who don't have androgenic alopecia, and and this increased level of Pi-1 makes them more sensitive to DHT. After all, there are hundreds of gene abnormalities associated with androgenic alopecia, so it is possible that some of these abnormalities also affect Pi-1 levels. If this were true, it might explain why there is an association between androgenic alopecia and heart disease, since higher levels of Pi-1 could also cause blood clots and heart attacks. I talked about this association between androgenic alopecia and heart disease in my video on finasteride and heart disease which I'll link below in case you're interested in learning more about that. The other possible link to androgenic alopecia is between Pi-1 levels and prolactin. Prolactin, it increases Pi-1 levels, and the prolactin receptor inhibitor called HMI-115 is currently being looked at as a possible treatment for hair loss. I talked about this in my recent video on the subject that I'll link below, and in that video, I made the argument that prolactin is not a trash hormone like DHT, and that's because prolactin affects male libido, so therefore reducing prolactin effects with HMI-115 may end up causing some serious side effects. But if the effect of prolactin is mediated by something like Pi-1, then maybe lowering Pi-1 levels or blocking Pi-1 might do the same thing as blocking prolactin without all the negative side effects that come from blocking prolactin directly. So, one question this all raises is whether Pi-1 levels are actually increased in people with hair loss, and in particular in people with androgenic alopecia. Well, a study was begun in 2015 to do scalp biopsies in people with hair loss and look at the Pi-1 levels in the scalp. But unfortunately, it looks like the study was abandoned in 2021 after only enrolling 10 subjects. But maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves here. There may be some theoretical reasons Pi-1 might affect hair growth, but is there any scientific proof that it actually has any effect at all? Well, the evidence we have is yet another rodent study, and it's this one from 2007. This study used what's called transgenic mice, which means mice that have had gene replacement. I just did a video on gene replacement therapy in human beings that I'll link below, and even though gene replacement is a new therapy in humans, scientists have been using it in mice for many years now. What researchers do is they introduce the replacement genes directly into the mice embryos at an early stage, as you can see in these photos right here. Well. In this study, the investigators introduced a stable form of human Pi-1 into the mouse genome. This caused the mice to have high levels of human Pi-1 in their blood. So, what happened to these mice? Well, one thing that happened is that they failed to grow hair. In this figure here, the second mouse from the left has the human Pi-1 gene, and it has no hair. So, human Pi-1 does seem to be a factor that prevents hair growth, at least in mice, which brings up the possibility that lowering Pi-1 levels might promote hair growth. But in addition to having no hair, the mice with human Pi-1 had a lot of other bad outcomes as well. They had liver enlargement and deposits of amyloid in their brain, which is similar to what happens to people with Alzheimer's dementia. Not only that, they developed blood clots in their hearts and had heart attacks. So. I guess having no hair was the least of the problems for these mice. So anyways, it looks like having too much Pi-1 is bad for hair growth, but also bad in general. So would a drug that inhibits Pi-1 help with hair growth? Well, 
I hate to say this, but the answer is we don't know yet. However, there is a drug company that is investing in this treatment already. It is a company called Erion that is based in New England, and they are developing two drugs for androgenic alopecia, and these drugs are PI-1 inhibitors. The drugs are called ET-02, which is a topical drug, and ET-03, which is an oral drug. As you can see in this chart, both drugs are in very preliminary stages. There are no published studies, and all the data on these drugs so far are just jealously guarded secret data from the drug company itself. So the question is, are these PI-1 inhibitor drugs going to be realistic cures for androgenic alopecia? Apparently the drug company thinks so and even thinks they might cure gray hair as well as a bonus. However, I have to admit I'm pretty skeptical. At this point, we don't have any real evidence PI-1 is involved with androgenic alopecia at all. Even if it is toxic to hair and mice, that doesn't mean it has anything to do with hair loss in human beings. Even if these ET drugs were effective in stimulating hair growth, they could turn out to be pretty dangerous as well. They could increase the risk of bleeding, which could lead to strokes from bleeding in the brain, or gastrointestinal bleeding, for example. So I seriously doubt the oral ET drug would be safe at all. And even the topical drug would have to be shown to be safe, because any systemic absorption of this drug through the skin could be very, very dangerous. Finally, these drugs, of course, are in their very preliminary stages of development. It will be a long time before they are ready to hit the market if they are ever available at all, that is. There are a lot of other drugs on the horizon that I think will see the light of day in the near future, including treatments like pyrolutamide and GT20029. I mean, these ET drugs and the prolactin receptor blocking drug HMI115 both have the potential for major side effects, and since neither one specifically blocks the androgenic mechanism of androgenic alopecia, I think at best they may be mild mildly effective as growth stimulants, similar to minoxidil, but I'm skeptical of even that. Also, at least with the case of HMI-115, which is a monoclonal antibody against the prolactin receptor, it's likely the cost of treatment might end up being prohibitively expensive. Even though I am wrong, though, these treatments are way too far off to get that excited about. By the time things like monoclonal prolactin antibodies and ET-02 are on the market, we'll likely already have CRISPR gene editing technology to make androgenic alopecia irrelevant, which will make all these pharmaceutical options redundant anyways. So I think the hype is not worth it, quite frankly, although I'd still nevertheless be interested to see how the anti-aging properties of these treatments play out, but we'll have to wait and see. Certainly, when it comes to future hair loss treatments, my excitement for this one is pretty much close to the bottom of the list at this point. It's more promising than the broccoli theory, at least, but I'm definitely way more pumped about the Kintor drugs than this thing. Maybe we'll get some new data soon that gives us more of a reason to be optimistic, but I wouldn't hold my breath. There are plenty of other far more promising treatments on the horizon that will be available much sooner, and you chooms can count on me to give you the news about them as soon as I possibly can. So, keep fighting the good fight, my fellow hair loss witchers. I'll see you all soon. God bless.